I better be. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you, thank you, thank you for this opportunity. It's been a, a crazy, crazy week, but I want to thank Josh. I didn't know he was going to be here, so I get to say thank you too. He set up everything God has been putting on my heart last week for the sermon this week. He started, and there were a couple times where I said, I, I'm in the back listening, and I'm saying, Lord, Lord, let him stop there. Let him stop there, because he's going to tell the whole story. Or, wait, wait, I, I want to make this point, you know, and I went, oh, Lord, if he says it, he says it. But I want to thank you, Josh. Um, let me publicly, I, I've told you to your face, but you know how much I love you, you know. But Josh and his family did what I think is probably one of the most phenomenal jobs of being an interim pastor. They loved on you as though they were a pastor. They didn't look beyond. And darn if having him in the pulpit last week wasn't your way of saying thank you and showing the whole world that that's what an interim pastor does. It's not like he comes and then we forget about him. He got to come. And because he, he and his family dearly love you. And then I know, because I've talked to Josh, we're both excited about Aaron. I mean, what a gift from God. Another family that dearly loves you, that is reaching out. You know, took the, the, the baton from, jo from Pete to Josh to Aaron. And I think this town is being lit up for Jesus Christ. Okay? I just wanted to start with that. So, you know what? I decided I'm going to stand. This message is too important to get too comfy with. So, one of the big stories that Josh said last week was the story of Horatio Spofford, who we've all heard the story of It Is Well Within My Soul. And we talked about the darkness of what that man must have felt to lose four daughters and then to be on the sea to see the exact spot where that happened. I've always thought that was the most, I've heard that story multiple times. But I didn't realize that was not the darkest moment of Horatio Spafford and his wife's life. I'd like to share with you, as Paul Harvey would say, the rest of the story. After he jotted down the words to it as well with, his, with my soul, they went back to Chicago and the couple tried to start over again. A son was born to them and then a daughter. Maybe the worst was over. But then another tragedy. The boy died of scarlet fever at four years old. Inexplicitly, the family's church took the view that tragedies were surely the punishment of a rash a wrathful God for some unexplained or unspoken sin on the part of the Spaffords. An elder in the church that had helped build the church, Horatio was asked to leave rather than being taken in and comforted by a healing community. Can you imagine anything more dark? Josh did a wonderful job of laying down the foundation of darkness, but darkness has so many tentacles. I can just imagine at that point, here Rachel Spafford was saying, I know I wrote those words, but it's not well with my soul. He'd have every right to, right? I mean, even the very people that said they believe in Christ and his love turned and didn't even support him. In 1881, the little family left the United States 
to begin a new life in Jerusalem. They rented a house in the old city section, and with the goal of imitating the lives of first century Christians as closely as possible, they soon were widely known for their love and service to the needy, as well as for their devotion to the scriptures. Even today, the Spafford Children's Center serves Jerusalem and the West Bank by providing health care and educational support to as many as 30,000 children annually under the leadership of the Spafford descendants. Anna and Horatio Spafford, suffering severe testings of their family, they did not blame God for their suffering. They knew that he was in control. And because he could not be defeated, nor could they, their faith grew. And that they learned that even in the midst of their pain, they could bless others and further the gospel. See, when our pain leads us to see him as uninvolved, that's when we would say it's not well with our soul. But God is faithful, whether we see it or not. The elements of, of darkness, there's an element of blindness because it's so dark that you cannot see in any direction. There's a loss of that direction. There's a loss of being able to take the next step, to have any movement because of the fear of what might be beyond our senses. When we're in the midst of severe, severe darkness, we have a fight or flight reaction. The blood drains from our magdula, which is the re reaction center or the thought process of our brain. And instantly, because the blood goes to all our extremities, our arms and our legs, so that we can run, we're not able to think and use our brain the way we should. That's why many, many, many decisions are made under the midst of fear and darkness. And yet that is not the time to make major decisions. How do we, before we get into the midst of darkness, how do we prepare? I want to say that in, in our homes or that type of thing, we prepare for when the electricity or the lights go up. We have flashlights or candles in strategic places. We prepare for the darkness. My message today is to help you prepare for the darkness. If you would turn to Psalm 107, Psalm 107, and as you're turning, I will say that in preparing we must use the Word of God. God's Word itself says that it is a light unto my path. As you reach Psalm 107, if you would go to uh, verse 10, please. Some sat in darkness and the deepest gloom, prisoners suffering in iron chains, for they had rebelled against the words of God and despised the counsel of the Most High. So he subjected them to bitter labor, they stumbled, and there was no one to help. Then they cried to the Lord in their trouble, and he saved them from their distress. He brought them out of darkness and the deepest gloom, and broke away their chains. As a chaplain and a counselor, I have counseled many a person and many a Christian who in the midst of darkness has been crying out to God and many times it's as simple and simplistic as if they were not prepared for the darkness because they were not in the Word of God. And even while in 
the darkness, because the brain wasn't thinking logically, they didn't turn to the Word of God. Can you imagine in the midst of a storm, in the darkest of darks, the light, the electricity goes out, you go to get the flashlight, but you forgot to put one out or you forgot to put the batteries in it beforehand. I'm about to give you a message that's going to sound like gloom and doom, and you're going to say, oh, oh, oh by the time, but I, this is going to be like the worst horror movie you ever saw in your entire life. But I want to promise you, spoiler alert, I'm not going to leave you without hope, okay? But I need to let you know, Satan is scheming. He's scheming and he's preparing, but he's not using the Word of God. He's doing everything and anything to keep you from the Word and to keep you from being in prayer with your Heavenly Father. He's going to use these three tactics. And if you think about just about any situation, it's one of these three. Satan is going to distract you. It can be just basic life activities that's going to distract you from being in the Word or allowing you to pray to God. It's as simple as this week. I uh, knew I had this sermon. I knew what God was putting on my heart. And the microphone went out on my phone. So I have a wonky ear, but now everybody that I was talking to, <laughs> I sounded like Charlie Brown's teacher. <laughs> Do you know how much that distracted me at first from being in the Word and preparing for this sermon and praying? I gotta get, I gotta get to, you know, my server. I gotta, I gotta get a different phone. I have. It was all encompassing, and it was so ridiculous. It was, I could not believe how much the enemy was able to get my mind focused on something. All I had to, if it was a really, really important call, all I had to do was go out and sit in my car, turn it on, and now I can use the microphone on the car. You know how I came up with that answer? I prayed. I realized, what, what could I do to get myself back in focus? Keep my eyes on what was important. He'll distract with all types of different things. David is a perfect example of that he was supposed to be out with his men in the midst of battle. But he's up on a rooftop, and what happens? He gets distracted. As simple as that, his thoughts are not where they should be, but they're distracted by Bathsheba. Satan will then, once he's got you distracted, he can now tempt you. Tempt you to take care of things yourself, take care of whatever the distraction is, take care of what you think is important. It's a temptation. And then last, he's going to take those two things and he's going to discourage you. He's going to discourage you, and I was so frustrated because I got a couple of very important phone calls, and I didn't have time to go out and get in my car, and I was being frustrated, so I, wait, I should probably just go take care of it and be done with it. I was discouraged, and that discouragement then got into the other elements of my life. All three of those things, distraction, tempting, discouragement, has one purpose. It's to cause us to lose heart. If he can accomplish that and we lose heart, it's, a, it's not an easy, easy path to get back to where we should be. I know it's just a prayer away, but if you've gotten to the point where you've lost heart, you've lost the energy and the ability to even think logically sometimes in the simplest of situations, which leads to fear. Fear at the root is all about self. Whenever we fear, it's because of love for ourself 
wait, wait, I'm going to interrupt you right there, Michael. Aren't we supposed to love ourselves, love our your neighbors as ourselves? No, there's proper self-love of taking care of yourself physically, taking care of yourself by being in the Word of God. And then there's self-love where I come first. And, you know, this situation demands I take care of it. I need to lash out or I need to let somebody know. No, self-love is not proper love. Self-concern, you know, I've got to look out for myself. If I don't take care of it, who's going to? And, of course, self-protection. If you think about it, sadly, all three of those were extremely evident during the whole process of COVID. Not only was there self-love of, you know, having to be by ourselves, but all it was was taking care of ourselves. Sometimes it was like keeping six feet away from, I heard of couples where keeping six feet away from each other is, you know, whenever possible in their home. Or self-concern. Or self-protection. But see, the truth is, those are all elements that Satan got to get you to fear. And it distracted you from what was important. It tempted you to simply listen to whatever was being said so that you could be discouraged because how long, how long is this going to go on? And it just led to more fear and more fear. Well, here comes the scary part of this sermon. This is what I call the reality check. The worst is yet to come. Not COVID, but things so much worse than COVID. See, the reality check is we are in the midst of a downward spiral. We have gotten to the point where the Bible is rejected, completely rejected, except for those that truly you know, call themselves Christians and live it out. There is no authority. All authority is rejected. We're trying to eliminate police departments. We're trying to eliminate common sense laws. There's the embracing of sin, tolerating every type of sin. Everything from fornication to homosexuality to go on and on and on and on is now embraced. And what that causes is the toleration of those ends up being an intoleration by us who believe God's word. But in that intoleration, we also end up being intolerated by others. If we stand up for what we think is right, in love, we are still, regardless, going to be persecuted. The day is coming to where, because we have spoken out, against the things that God's word clearly states are wrong because we speak out against it. I believe and I'm set for going to jail and even, it sounds ludicrous, but even giving my life. When I became ordained about too many years ago, I purposely, it was not so that I could put reverend before my name for myself or the title and so forth. I made the decision that when I would sign my name, I would sign it Reverend Michael Otto, so that I stood for what I believed and I couldn't hide behind, just not just behind my name, but they would know what I stood for and that when they came around and collected people that were clearly stating the word of God, I'd be the first to go. And wouldn't mind, because I got a feeling I would have one heck of a jail ministry. And if I die, and I got to know that I was going to die for what I believed in the word of God and the word of God supporting me, I would have won a spiritual lottery. Could you could you possibly go to heaven in any better, better situation? How can I say that? I know there are people out there that literally 
feel like, okay, I, I believe in preparation, you know, prepares us for the darkness, and, you know, we're supposed to be hearers of the word and not just, you know, we're supposed to be doers of the word, not just hearers. But if I obey the word of God, all fear evaporates. But if I disobey, and I know what the word of God says, but I hide behind, well, I'm afraid of, for myself that I might die. You know, I, I need to stick around. I've got a daughter. I've got people that, you know, care for me. If I'm preparing for that, then I'm not preparing with the proper heart. I'm challenging you today, from this moment forward, when you start to read scripture, realize that God is trying to prepare you so that you're going to be able to talk to people who you will at first clearly see as the enemy, or at least in collaboration with the enemy. Those that are partaking of every type of sin and so forth, it's so easy to put them in, the, in Satan's camp and leave them there. But that's what would be natural in our flesh. The truth is, we are supposed to have a response. And those that know me closely, I cannot pass up a, word, a, a play on words. If we're supposed to have a response, then we have a response ability. Our ability is going to be that we are going to give hope and love to those that are wallowing in sin and darkness and can't see a way out. I read that passage in Psalm 107 because it says there that they rebelled against the words of God. Is there any more clear definition of what sin is? Especially in today's world, that they there's something in their hearts that tells them what they're doing is wrong. There was for me and everything I you know, that's why I knew I needed to repent. It's why I knew I needed a savior. But right about now, it sounds like an awful scary situation. In fact, if you really conceptualize what it would be like to be persecuted and even possibly put to death for Christianity, which seems so ridiculous, but would you have believed if I told you five years ago that we'd be walking around for a whole year with masks up and doing whatever the government said and so forth, etc.? It's only a step away from being able to mandate other things. Not just not being able to meet as a community, but trying to demand that you no longer can even meet in one or two, or you can't, that they take away our Bibles. I know it seems ridiculous, but in this world, Satan does not play fair. So here comes the whole part, okay? In 1 Timothy 1.7, you're all familiar with it, Paul tells Timothy, who is a very timid, very scared individual, because he's being called to that very environment of darkness, where Christians are persecuted and, yes, being put to death. But Paul tells Timothy, you've not been given a spirit of timidity or weakness, but you've been given a spirit of power and love and sound mind. Do you realize those aren't just words? That's a promise. And it's not a promise to the whole world. It's a promise to you as a follower of Jesus Christ. And that makes you not ordinary people. The moment you gave your life to Jesus Christ, you said, do what you will with me, because you have bought me with your blood. You have given the ultimate sacrifice with your life. Therefore, as my Savior, I give you mine. When you're able to focus on that power and focus on that love 
and focus on having a sound mind. It's not that you can do it within yourself. It's because you have the Holy Spirit within you. It's as simple as saying, I can't, but you can through me. It's as simple as being focused on God's Word rather than yourself. In 1 John 4, 7 through 10, we hear that God is love. And if we love God, then we'll love one another. And so we haven't seen God, but when we love one another, we can see that love. And what I'm asking you to do when the time comes is that I'm actually asking you to give that love, not to, just to your brothers and sisters who are being persecuted. I'm asking you to love your enemies. Not because I said it, but because Jesus Christ said, love your friends, your best buddies, just the people from church. He said, love your enemies. I think you see it. Our Lord Jesus set such an example. He was persecuted, and I don't believe any of us will go through crucifixion, but think of what he did on the cross, and he was able to still pray for him and say, forgive them, for they know not what they do. He made it possible by shedding his blood for us to face whatever darkness comes upon the face of the earth. I want to thank, I'm sorry, I'm terrible with names, and the young lady who shared the testimony of that she had worry over her husband's physical condition. There's not a person here in this room that doesn't worry about all manner of situations. But to confess the worry takes all the power away from it. See, worry, and I'm going to quote Corey Tendum now, worry doesn't take the power away from the sorrow of tomorrow. It takes away the power and strength of today. If we're so focused about what's going to happen, we're not going to prepare. We're not going to put batteries in our flashlight. We're not going to put the Word of God in our heart. There is a chasm that fits love, joy, peace, all the fruits of the Spirit in our hearts to prepare us for darkness. When we can focus on the truth, and when we can focus on His love, I promise you, regardless of the pain you go through in the darkness, you'll be able to give joy because He'll give you the ability to give, have joy, even through the blur of your tears. Not only do I promise, but He promises. Let us pray. Dear God, I thank you for the protection and the enemy did not want me to share his tactics. And I thank you that you gave me the strength to get the message out. Lord, we're not, uh, we're not asking for a fight, but we're going to be prepared for a fight, not to take out our enemy, but to take our enemy with us if possible. Lord, they don't know any better. And I pray that we can love on them so much that they will literally say, I want what they have. And what we have, Lord, is you. So, Lord, um, I can't imagine living life without you, and I, I just know everybody that I know in this room truly can't imagine life without you either. So that's why we're here, to worship you and thank you. Lord, may we prepare. May we take all the things that your word has for us to be able to prepare for the future. We know your light will shine, Lord. 
but may we be the instrument. May we be the flashlight to others that they might see your truth.